Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Today we will present for your consideration a very different concept for spacecraft propulsion. There is no area of physics more mysterious to my understanding than that of electromagnetic fields. These have always seemed to me to be the closest thing to real magic of anything we experience in everyday life. Anyone who has tried to put the same poles of two magnets together has felt the strange force pushing them apart. Nothing has to be in the space between them except this manifestation of pure force. It works just fine in a vacuum and can cause a physical object to defy gravity and levitate. While regular magnets can do this, superconductors are particularly good at it. And while a magnetic field can pass through most solids without a problem, as a superconductor is cooled to below its critical temperature, it starts to work like a magnetic mirror, rejecting and reflecting back any magnetic field that tries to go through it. This superconductor starts to repel the magnet and levitates it against the gravity field generated by our entire planet. Superconductors are discussed in several of our lessons. Electromagnetism is one of the four fundamental forces of nature, along with the weak and strong nuclear forces and, of course, gravity. Electricity and magnetism were once considered different forces, but it was discovered that they were two aspects of the same force. A moving electrical charge creates a magnetic field, while a moving magnetic field or a conductor moving through a magnetic field, can also generate an electric current. Here we see a wire. As current flows through the wire, a magnetic field is created. On the other hand, if we take a coil of copper wires and pass a magnet over them, we will create an electric current. This is how generators work. We have discussed using magnetic fields to control ions in ion propulsion engines, discussed in these lessons and we have discussed using them to create force fields for protection and re-entry. Seen in this recent lesson, and an earlier one here. Finally, we have discussed using magnetic fields to control and compress subatomic particles, so that we can create energies and densities sufficient to cause fusion, which was most recently discussed here, but we actually have an entire series on. Today we are going to start by examining something seemingly unrelated that will tie in later. The Boring Company was started in December of 2016, and you may be familiar with the founder. The current president is Mr. Steve Davis. The Boring Company is headquartered in Austin, Texas. Austin is also the home of a new gigafactory. The Boring Company was started ostensibly because its founders saw a need for large, long tunnels to be dug under city infrastructure that can be used to relieve traffic congestion or to install a hyperloop system between cities. The hyperloop is a concept introduced by Robert Goddard that was promoted by Elon Musk. It's basically a long tube with low air pressure through which a high-speed maglev train can travel at what would be supersonic speeds at normal air density. Trains traveling over 1,600 kilometers per hour are possible. This would be over 1,000 miles per hour for my American friends. The Boring Company started by modernizing tunnel drilling equipment. Humans have been boring tunnels for a long time. All major civilizations, from ancient Egypt, Ethiopia, India, China, Greece, Rome, Babylon, and the Aztecs all developed some form of this technology. But it was mainly human-powered and slow-going until 1952. In 1952, the Robbins Company developed this massive tunnel-boring machine, and it was used to help create the Oahe Dam project in South Dakota. This machine used what are called drag bits and these dumbbell-shaped cutters to chew through relatively weak shale rock. 
This technique would not work with harder materials, however. So in 1956, rolling disc cutters were invented. This machine was 11.2 meters or about 36 feet in diameter. The new cutters allowed the machine to bore through solid rock. This is beneficial for many reasons. If you bore through soil or loose rock, you have to build a metal or concrete tunnel to prevent it from collapsing behind you. Going through solid rock allows the tunnel to provide much of its own support. In 1964, the first compressed air tunneling machine was invented and used to create a 2.9 kilometer tunnel in Paris, France. Then machines were invented that allowed automatic tunnel lining. A giant machine like this was used to connect England and France through what is called the tunnel. This tunnel is a little over 50 kilometers long and is up to 75 meters below the seabed. High-speed trains like the Eurostar travel through part of the tunnel. The boring company's first boring machine was called Gutted and purchased from a Canadian company called Lovat. It was used to research tunnel boring technology. Then, with the help of engineers from SpaceX, the boring company designed and built Proofrock. Proofrock was up to 15 times faster than most existing tunnel boring machines. Though these tunnels were only 3.7 meters in diameter, Proofrock was able to continuously mine while adding tunnel walls without stopping. It was able to start on the surface and dive down into the earth, climbing back out when it was finished, removing the need for entrance and exit construction. And Proofrock uses electric power, replacing diesel motors and reducing the need for ventilation, while improving reliability and torque. This machine is advanced, but it has not revolutionized the tunnel boring industry. Other machines work almost as well here on Earth. But let's look at an environment where this machine would be better than any other device available and see how it might be related to space science. It is immediately obvious that diesel machines would require an oxygen environment to function. The electric boring company machines would not. This machine can also tunnel down into the ground from a level surface and climb back out, critical for use on other worlds. Now let's imagine landing one of these on the moon with a small nuclear generator or large solar panel farm to provide power. With a long enough cable, this machine could tunnel through a crater wall or mountains like these that often form at the center of a large impact. We could seal both ends of the tunnel with dual walled airlocks providing an immediate large habitat for crop cultivation and living space, safe from the cosmic radiation that is everywhere in space. These machines would of course work just fine on Mars also. I know that there are lava tubes on both worlds that might work fine too, and with no major geological activity these are an option. But lunar and Martian lava tubes are massive and would require a tremendous amount of work and resources to seal the entrance as well as finding anywhere they might leak, and providing hundreds of tons of gas to give them an atmosphere. This will not be practical as humanity starts its migration into the solar system, though it would be possible at some point to provide a low-pressure pure oxygen atmosphere produced by the electrolysis of water on other worlds. But to get started, we won't have the infrastructure to capitalize on these massive lava tubes, but we could create a much smaller tunnel through solid rock, producing our immediate shielded habitat. This machine could also be used for mining. While much of the moon's crust is aluminum and titanium, two very useful metals for human construction, the moon gives us access to other metals also. Metals are critical to humanity's success in space. Everyone is in fact very excited right now, calculating the worth of the asteroid 16 Psyche. This asteroid is far away out here in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. We cannot see Psyche clearly with our telescopes from this distance, but radar tells us how fast it is spinning and its size, while calculations of density tell us that it is almost certainly made of metal, most likely the surviving core of a small planet, destroyed in a collision we could not imagine. A probe will be launched August 1st, 2022, from the 39A launch pad at Kennedy Space Center on a Falcon Heavy rocket, which is right now the most powerful rocket launching from Earth. 
The probe will need to travel about 2.4 billion kilometers, which, using solar electric propulsion, will take about three and a half years. The probe will have large solar panels to convert sunlight into electricity, which it will feed to these ion engines. These are Hall thrusters, which are named for their inventor, Edwin Hall. There will be a link to a patent in the description. Thrusters like these were used on Deep Space One, launched in 2001 to visit an asteroid and a comet, and on the Dawn spacecraft mission to Vesta and Ceres, two large dwarf planets in the asteroid belt. Hall thrusters use a magnetic field to create ions and an electric field to accelerate them out of the engine at very high speeds, over 10 times the exhaust velocity of chemical rocket engines. While our other favorite ion engine, the magnetoplasma dynamic thruster uses an electric field to ionize the propellant and a magnetic field to accelerate the ions. This blue glow tells us they are using xenon as a propellant, as each gas has its own characteristic color when ionized. While the thrust of an ion engine is usually very low, the specific impulse is very high. Over time, the probe will accelerate to about 200,000 kilometers per hour. The Psyche probe will have 922 kilograms of xenon on board. If we used chemical rockets instead, we would need 15 times as much propellant. Probes like these, however, still use a hypergolic like hydrazine for the reaction control system. Once the RCS system is out of hypergolic propellant, the probe cannot keep itself pointed in the right way to look at its target or report back to Earth. The Dawn mission was active for 11 years before it ran out of hypergolics. The Psyche probe will arrive in 2026, and just like Messenger, that scanned the planet Mercury using instruments, discussed at length in this lesson, the Psyche probe will also use neutron analysis to see what Psyche is made of. The probe will communicate with Earth using X-band radio waves sent back to the Deep Space Network. The Deep Space Network consists of 70-meter dish antennas, placed all around the world, to listen to distant space probes. As the Earth spins, these antennas hand off the signals to maintain continuous contact. The Psyche probe will use a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer, often abbreviated GRNS. A probe like this can analyze gamma rays, created when cosmic radiation slams into an object, or when the instrument fires high-speed neutrons at the target. Just like silicone crystals can turn visible light into electricity, ultra-pure germanium crystals can turn gamma rays into an electric signal. The strength of this signal is determined by the wavelength of the gamma ray photon. Each element generates a characteristic wavelength of gamma ray. The germanium helps us see the colors of these gamma rays, which tells us what metals are in the surface. One problem with this device is that during its journey through space, it was itself struck by cosmic rays. Since cosmic rays are just high-speed atoms thrown out into the universe by black holes, supernovae, and other cosmic events, they contaminate our germanium crystal and cause its performance to degrade. The Psyche probe team members, some of whom worked on the messenger probe, have discovered that we can heat the germanium crystal and expel these atomic impactors, making the crystal just like new again. This technique will be used on the Psyche probe. The spacecraft will use the GNRS to scan Psyche and tell us how much iron and nickel as well as heavier elements like gold and platinum are in its composition. It turns out that when the Earth was molten, all of our gold, platinum, uranium, and heavier elements sank to the core of our planet, while lighter rocks, made mostly of silicates, floated to the surface to make our continents. The only reason we find these heavier metals on the surface today is because asteroids with these metals have impacted the Earth after its surface was no longer molten. These impacts created large craters, but most of these have been worn away by erosion, while some are still visible, like this famous one in Arizona and this one in Europe. We can just see the remnants of this one in Canada, and there is a massive one under the ice of Greenland. The one that killed the dinosaurs is mostly worn away, and much of it is under the ocean. Most of these impacts were not made by metallic meteorites or asteroids. 
They were made by comets, mostly water with some rocks and lighter materials, like the one that exploded over Chelyabinsk, Russia in 2013. These less dense materials are definitely useful in space, but we have a lot of these available on Earth. Asteroids don't have as much ice as a comet. Asteroids are usually classified as C-type, S-type, or M-type, with another category of rare types to cover the less common ones. C-type stands for carbonaceous and are mostly carbon. Think of clays, since these asteroids have complex carbon molecules, with a lesser amount of rocks and other minerals. 75% of known asteroids are of this type. S-type are mainly silicone and oxygen. These elements form silicates. Think of mostly stone, with only a small amount of metals and volatiles, like most of the rocks on Earth. Here you can see that these stony meteorites are very similar in composition to the Earth's crust. About 17% of asteroids are this type. That leaves the rest of the 8% of asteroids as mostly M-type though other subdivisions like U-type, H-type, and P-type are also used. M-type stands for metallic, and these asteroids are mostly metals like iron and nickel. Iron is still common on the Earth's surface, due to volcanoes pushing it back up, but because most of the impactors were not metal, heavier elements are rare on the surface of Earth. If we could tunnel to the core of our planet, we would find an unimaginable amount of gold and platinum as well as radioactive elements. But we would have to swim through over a thousand kilometers of molten iron to get there. Psyche would be much easier to mine than the core of the Earth. I quite often hear that platinum and gold would become worthless if they were available in large quantities. They have a point that these metals would become more common and less expensive. But these metals have a worth besides the jewelry we wear. Heavy metals like palladium and platinum make the best catalysts and are used in cars as catalytic converters to turn toxic pollution into less harmful chemicals. But platinum's expense keeps us from being able to use these on a large scale. Catalytic converters are so expensive that people will even steal them to sell. Platinum was also used in the Apollo fuel cells, as nothing beats platinum for efficiency and durability. Having better catalysts available would also make it much easier to turn solar energy into hydrogen fuel on Earth through electrolysis. And gold is the perfect metal for many electronic circuits. Kilograms of gold get used in billion-dollar communication satellites, which is one reason why they are billions of dollars. Among other qualities, gold is much more tolerant of radiation damage than other metals. But is there a better way to mine for these metals closer to Earth? This is our moon, and every crater you see was the result of an impact. Most of these were either comets, leaving some water on the moon for us to use, or carbonaceous, and we can always use some carbon, or silicate. We'll need silicone to make solar panels. But a few of these impactors will have been metallic. While most of the moon's crust is light material, silicates and metals like aluminum and titanium, the M-type impacts will have left some heavier metals, like gold and platinum, embedded into the crust of the moon. In fact, here we see what's called the Aitken Basin, near the south pole of the moon. There is water here at the south pole, protected from the sun by these craters, the bottoms of which are in eternal darkness. The basin is about 2,500 kilometers in diameter and between 6.2 and 8.2 kilometers deep. It has been discovered that this basin was formed as one of the largest impact craters in the solar system about 4.2 billion years ago, when a large asteroid impacted the moon, burying itself under the moon's crust and creating this ring of mountains that can be seen from Earth. The Chinese Chang'e 4 spacecraft landed in this basin. Here, at a crater called Von Karman. Why might this be an interesting place to land? Orbital analysis had shown that the crater floor had an unusually high level of heavier elements. While most of the moon's crust is composed of lighter materials, here they found metals like iron and thorium. After carefully studying the Aitken Basin, 
Scientists have determined that it was formed in a low-velocity, low-angle impact by an object about 200 kilometers in diameter. This object buried itself into the moon and was covered by about 10 kilometers of lunar crust. The mass of this object indicates a high amount of metal. That means that the south pole of the moon should have plenty of water, titanium, aluminum, and silicone, as well as iron, nickel, and thorium, and just possibly gold and platinum. If anyone truly wants to build massive orbital habitats capable of housing millions if not billions of people, this would be the best place to start. The citizens of the moon could mine materials here for their own use and send materials out to build and supply colonies at the Earth-Moon Lagrange points or the Earth-Sun Lagrange points. The nation that first gains access to this region of the moon will be able to rapidly gain an almost insurmountable lead over other nations. What might be the ultimate use of all the technology we discussed today? I mentioned before that it's not possible to tunnel down through the core of the Earth, because the core of the Earth is about 50% the diameter of the entire planet, and is still molten and spinning, creating our volcanoes and the Earth's magnetic field. But there are no volcanoes on the Moon today because its core is much smaller, being only about 20% the diameter of the moon, with only a small portion being molten. That means we could use one of these amazing electric tunneling machines, powered with a nuclear reactor or a large solar array and cables, to bore through the upper mantle and middle mantle to go all the way through the moon and come out on the other side, lining the tunnel with aluminum, titanium, and steel alloys as we go. This tunnel, being placed here in relation to the moon's orbit, would make it so the tunnel's exit was always pointing out into the solar system. And since the moon is tidally locked to the Earth, over every 30-day period would point to any location in the plane of the solar system. What would be the purpose of such a tunnel? The moon's diameter is 3,475 kilometers. If we estimate this tunnel as 2,500 kilometers in length, and we place magnetic rails around the perimeter of the tunnel to levitate objects and keep them away from the sides, as well as aluminum electromagnets along the length of the tunnel, we could build a large automated cargo vessel and place a large amount of water and other valuable resources mined from the moon here at the entrance. This ship could have self-powered electromagnets along its length. Once released, the vessel would at first accelerate due to gravity. We would then turn the electromagnets in the tunnel on, and the ship would start accelerating even faster. If the ship were built sturdy enough, we could accelerate it at up to 10 Gs without hurting the cargo. Accelerating at 10 Gs over 2,500 kilometers, what will the velocity be when we come out here? Let's look at some equations for acceleration. Acceleration equals the change in velocity over the change in time. We can rearrange this to say the change in velocity equals the acceleration multiplied by the change in time, or that the change in time equals the change in velocity divided by the acceleration. We have the acceleration, but we don't have the change in velocity or the change in time. Velocity can also be written as the change in distance, usually denoted as ds, over the change in time, dt. Substituting this equation for velocity, we can say that acceleration equals ds over dt squared, or that ds equals a times dt squared, and so dt would equal the square root of ds over a. Let's start with this last one. We have the change in distance. It's 2,500 kilometers. We know the acceleration. We decided on 10 meters per second squared. If we put these into our equation, we get 500 seconds. That would be about 8.33 minutes. And now that we have the time, we can use this equation to calculate the velocity. The change in velocity after accelerating at 10 meters per second squared for 500 seconds will be 5,000 meters per second, or five kilometers per second. This is plenty of delta V to get us out to all the Lagrange points between the Earth and the Moon and the Earth and Sun. And if we built a much sturdier ship and tripled the acceleration, we could generate up to 15 kilometers per second. 
Remember that it takes about 12.5 kilometers per second to get supplies to Mercury, one of the hardest destinations to reach in the solar system by Delta V. Mercury has a lot of resources, and some water, but will need more once it has a large colony there. And it only takes about 10.7 kilometers per second to get out to Jupiter. You can quickly see that with no propellant at all, we can get large cargo ships on their way to these destinations where they can use onboard propellant to stop, or, once we have enough infrastructure in place, turn robots loose on near-Earth asteroids, Jovian asteroids, and the Martian moons Phobos and Deimos, to make a massive electromagnetic decelerator. This would be a long tube with powerful electromagnets. It would need to be very long, and have a lot of mass to absorb the kinetic energy of the moving cargo ship, while holding itself together and not crushing the ship under hundreds of Gs. Absorbing the momentum will move the decelerator proportional to its mass, but this can be offset over a little time by efficient magnetoplasma dynamic thrusters, which would move it back into place after it received or launched a ship. Mercury will have to build one in orbit with local resources, unless the colonists can find a nearby asteroid. But once built, these magnetic catapult systems could use nothing but electromagnetic energy to trade resources and products across the solar system. Something to think about. Thanks for listening. Please help support us on Patreon or shop at the Academy Store. And stay safe. At Astro Proterra. Thank you.